United Kingdom. I move to First Minister's question. Question number one, Keza Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Presiding Officer, later today I will be confirming that the just published recommendation of the NHS pay review body for a 1% consolidated pay rise for all Agenda for Change staff will be accepted in full by this government. Uh, Parliament will recall that last year Scotland was the only part of the UK to accept the pay review body recommendation. Keza Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer, and we very much welcome that. Yesterday, the First Minister confirmed that she still supports full fiscal autonomy for Scotland within the United Kingdom. That means all tax and spending from Scotland remains in Scotland. Can the First Minister confirm that full fiscal autonomy means scrapping the Barnet formula, yes or no? First Minister. Well, so much for the new style, patriotic Scottish <laughs> Labour Party. <laughs> It didn't really last very long, did it? The first opportunity they grabbed to get right back onto the same side as the Tories to gleefully tell Scotland how useless they think we are. The Barnet formula... Order! The Barnet formula, of course, Order. will remain in place until such times as this Parliament is in charge of our own fiscal and economic decisions. It's members of the unionist parties on all sides of this chamber that pose the risk to the Barnet formula in the meantime. And can I say also to Kezia Dugdale, the only cuts that are on the horizon this year or the following year for Scotland are the cuts planned by Westminster, regardless of whether it's the Tories or Labour. It's only a few weeks since Labour trooped through the Tory lobbies to vote for £30 billion of cuts. It's Labour who, if left to their own devices, will impose cuts on Scotland. And the only way to stop them is to vote SNP, because only the SNP offers an alternative to Tory austerity. Ms. Dugdale. President Officer, Labour voted against austerity last week in the House of Commons. <laughs> Order! And where were the SNP posted missing, just like they were the night of the national minimum wage? As the First Minister well knows, full fiscal autonomy does mean scrapping the Barnet formula. Only in the world of the SNP would we stop paying into a UK-wide system but expect the same system to continue to pay out to us. Last year, the First Minister said scrapping Barnet would cost Scotland £4 billion. Yesterday, Scotland's official accounts confirmed she was absolutely right. Does Nicola Sturgeon still agree with herself that scrapping Barnet would have cost Scotland £4 billion last year? First Minister, yes. order. First Everybody Minister. will be noticing that the people applauding most loudly for Kezia Dugdale uh, were our colleagues uh, on the Tory benches. Uh, Kezia, Dugdale, order. Kezia Dugdale referred to the motion that Labour proposed and voted for in the House of Commons last week. Luckily, I brought a copy of that motion with me today. So I'm going to read it to Kezia Dugdale. It calls on the government to take an approach which involves, and I quote, reductions in public spending. In other words, what Labour voted for in the House of Commons last week was further cuts to be imposed on Scotland. And it's because the SNP doesn't propose cuts that we voted against Labour's austerity motion in the House of Commons. Now, we face a choice, presiding officer. Order. Let us hear the First the Minister. This is the choice at the heart of the figures that were published yesterday. We can decide that we want to stay at the mercy of never-ending Westminster cuts, cuts that have already cost the Scottish budget £12 billion and are estimated to cost it £14.5 billion over the next five years, £1,000 for every person in Scotland, or we can take more control over our own finances so that we can build a better future. I know what side of that choice I'm on. 
I also know what side of that choice Kezia Dugdale and Labour is on. It's the same side as the Tories. Kezia Dugdale. Ms Dugdale. The First Minister herself has said repeatedly that scrapping the Barnet formula would have cost Scotland £4 billion last year. And this SNP leaflet, put through doors at the moment, says that scrapping Barnet would lead to billions of pounds worth of cuts. SNP cuts! With a plummeting oil price, the independent experts at the FSP say Order. the cost to Scotland will rise to around £6.6 billion. That means massive spending cuts over and above what we would get from the Tories winning in May. Huge cuts to the budget for our NHS and our schools. It's austerity on a scale never seen before in Scotland. It's austerity max, presiding officer. Can the First Minister tell us how many jobs in Scotland would be lost under the SNP's plans to scrap the Barnet formula? First Minister. I, I don't think it will have escaped anybody's notice that Kezia Dugdale has just said that Westminster governments pose a threat to NHS funding in Scotland. I seem to remember that during the referendum, Absolutely. Labour denied point blank that that was the case. And it's because people know that they cannot trust a single word that Scottish Labour says anymore, that people in Scotland are deserting them in their droves. Now, Kezia Dugdale has got a nerve to come here today and scaremonger about mythical cuts Order. when just 60 miles away from here, the most senior Labour councillor in the country is calling on the Scottish Government to take away old people's bus passes, introduce tuition fees and start charging again for prescriptions. I think Labour needs to sort itself out before it comes to this chamber to lecture anybody else. Dugdale. Ms Dugdale. Officer, I asked the First Minister very specifically about jobs. According to the SNP government's own economic modelling, reducing government spending in Scotland by £6.5 billion would mean a cut of around 5% in our GDP. Forget the dry theoretical numbers, President Officer. That's 138,000 Scottish jobs. That's one in every 16 jobs. Thousands of families facing the prospect of being out of work and struggling to make ends meet. And the cause of it would be the SNP's reckless plan for full fiscal autonomy. After years of telling us only they stand up for Scotland, we now know the reality is different. Far from standing up for Scotland, isn't it the case that the SNP's Barnet bombshell would cost well over 100,000 Scottish jobs? First Minister. First Minister. You know, if anybody wonders why Labour is in the dire straits that it's in, it only has to listen to Kezia Dugdale today. She's got the temerity to mention jobs. Under this government, we've got lower unemployment and higher employment than any other part of the UK. And people in Scotland know Order. that I and the SNP and the Scottish Order. Government don't propose cuts. We want to grow our economy so we can protect Scotland from Labour and Tory cuts. The only people proposing cuts, presiding officer, are the Tories, the Liberals and the Labour Party. We know they want to impose more cuts on Scotland and the only way to stop that is to send SNP MPs to Westminster to force them into an alternative. Question two. Ruth Davidson. Ms Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when she will next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. Uh, I've no current plans to meet the Prime Minister unless, of course, he finds the backbone to join the TV leaders' debate on the 2nd of April. <laughs> Ruth Davidson. I'm pleased, as we've all heard the announcement in just the last hour, that all of the four main party leaders in here have agreed to an STV debate uh, just a month before the election. Uh, so... Can I ask the First Minister about a recent speech of hers where she said that she wanted Britain to borrow an extra £180 billion, landing the UK even deeper in the red? Yesterday, my colleague Gavin Brown asked the Deputy First Minister when, under the SNP's plans, Britain would have finally eliminate the deficit. The Deputy First Minister replied, and I quote, much later. So can I ask the First Minister to be more specific? 
How much later? In which year, under her plans, would the UK no longer be in deficit? First Minister. Well, it's no secret that I take a very, very different approach on austerity to Ruth Davidson and her colleagues. Under the plans that we have published that would see modest increases in public spending, modest increases that would help us to invest in skills and infrastructure and innovation, invest more in our public services, invest to protect the vulnerable that her party's policies are hitting so hard. Under these plans, debt and deficit as a share of our national income would reduce every year over the next parliament. But I do not, I do not pretend uh, otherwise than that I argue for a slower debt and deficit reduction than the Tories do, because I want an alternative to austerity. I don't want the cuts that Tories are proposing to go on harming the most vulnerable and harming our public services. That's the difference between us. It was a pretty long answer, but I only asked for a short one. Just one year. Just one year. That's all I asked for. But it's clear the SNP haven't a clue. So they've no answer about their own plans for Britain. So let me ask the First Minister about her plan for Scotland. Because yesterday she was quoted as saying, short of independence, I believe we should have full fiscal autonomy. In response to yesterday's JERS figures and to that statement, the Impartial Institute for Fiscal Studies said that this would result in, and I quote again, substantial spending cuts or tax rises in Scotland. Tax rises equaling 15 pence to income tax for every earner in Scotland. In the past, presiding officer, I repeatedly asked the First Minister's predecessor to give a detailed rebuttal to IFS projections, but he never did. So I am asking this First Minister, can she tell us now in this chamber why the IFS is wrong? First Minister. Let's look in detail at the IFS report from yesterday that Ruth Davidson talks about. What she has quoted was predicated in Scotland uh, being fiscally autonomous in 2015-16. Now, for Ruth Davidson's information, 2015-16 starts in two and a half weeks' time. We're not going to have fiscal autonomy then, but perhaps more fundamentally, perhaps more fundamentally, Order. if Ruth Davidson... Order, if let's Ruth hear Davidson, the First Minister. If Ruth Davidson had had the honesty to complete Order. the IFS sentence about tax rises or spending cuts, she'd find it says Order. this, and I quote, unless credible policies to boost growth of Scotland's onshore economy and revenues are developed. That's the whole point. We have a choice. We can accept never-ending Westminster cuts from the Tories, the Liberals and Labour. Or we can take more control of our own finances and we can build a better future for this country. Here, here. I know what side I stand on. John Mason. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. Given it is Commonwealth Week, can the First Minister affirm the Government's commitment to the Commonwealth legacy in my constituency and the rest of the East End of Glasgow? And would she welcome the Auditor General's report on the successful management of the Games? First Minister. Well, as today's <laughs> Audit Scotland report shows, Glasgow 2014 was a spectacular success delivered under budget and we are firmly committed to securing a lasting social, cultural and economic legacy from the Games for the East End of Glasgow and indeed for the whole of the country. At the heart of this success is the transformation we've seen in the East End of Glasgow, world-class sporting facilities and venues, new community facilities, improved infrastructure and an award-winning housing development at the Athletes' Village. I saw that for myself recently. And today we've announced £600,000 funding for Clyde Gateway to ensure that the legacy continues, helping more communities across the East End uh, by providing training and employment opportunities and by encouraging people to get more active. I would hope everybody across this chamber would welcome that and take this opportunity to again congratulate everybody associated with the success of Glasgow 2014. <laughs> Presiding officer, Dundee's last independent mid-size builder, Muirfield, has applied to the court for the appointment of an administrator. What can the Scottish Government do to support the 250 people whose jobs are under threat? And what does the First Minister think about the economic situation where we are seeing local firms of this size and importance in our communities unable to survive? First Minister. 
Well, Jenny Mara raises an important issue and we have to do everything we can to protect local companies. In the particular case, she cites, the government uh, will of course be in contact, PACE arrangements will be in place and we will be in dialogue uh, with Dundee City Council. Of course, there's going to be uh, a huge construction boost to the city of Dundee through the v and &E, and uh, we should all welcome that, but we should also make sure we're doing everything we can to support smaller businesses as we recover from the recession. Question three, will it rainy? To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Will there any? On Monday, the First Minister was wrong on our plan to borrow £180 billion. She said debt would go down. But yesterday, John Swinney admitted it will go up. Her whole government was wrong to base its plans on an oil boom. And yesterday's JERS figures were the final devastating blow to her economics. When she gets so much wrong, what economic plan does she have left? First Minister. Well, I would have thought money might have been the last subject the Liberal Democrats wanted to talk about today. I think we've had an interesting insight into how they deal with the indebtedness of their own party today. But on the specific question that Willie Rennie raises, I absolutely stand by what I said about the opportunity for £180 billion additional spending, modest increases in spending, but at 0.5% a year in real terms, I think that's preferable to the painful cuts that the Tories and the Liberals are imposing. But even if I'm being very charitable and I'm accepting in full the Treasury methodology in the paper they published this week. Then in order to get debt reducing in every year and to be lower at the end of the Parliament, you could still spend £165 billion. So I'm happy to compromise with Willie Rennie. If he's uh, happy for extra spending as long as we can get debt reducing, why don't we settle in £165 billion? Well, Rennie. She needs to come clean about what she claims. Order. She needs to come clean Order. about what Let's she claims. Order, let's hear Mr Rennie. She said that debt would go down as a proportion of GDP, and it is going up. John Swinney admitted it yesterday. She should have the courage to admit it as well. The UK economic record is sound. Let's just remember, record high employment. Wages outstripping. The members should listen to this because they said this would never work. Record high employment. Wages outstripping inflation. The highest growth in the G7. And the prospect of balancing the books so we don't have to borrow to pay for day-to-day -day services. This, this, is the economics. this is the economics she said would not work. Her plan, her plan adds £4.7 billion worth of debt interest to the books. That's 180 secondary schools not being built every year because we have to pay her debts. How is that, how is that fair to future generations? First Minister. Well, let me go back to the start of Willie Rennie's question. There's certainly somebody who needs to come clean today in politics, uh, but it's nobody on these benches. But Willie Rennie also says that the policy of the Tory Liberal government is working. The policies of the Tory and Liberal Westminster government are hitting the 10% poorest in our country hardest. Now, if Willie Rennie is proud of that, then that is his prerogative. But if that is what the Liberal Democrats have come to stand for, yeah, exactly. no wonder people can't wait to give them a complete doing at the ballot box <laughs> on May the 7th. I think people, presiding officer, today watching this session of First Minister's questions will have come to a very clear conclusion. If you want cuts, then you can vote for any one of the Tories, the Liberals or Labour. But if you want a clear and principled alternative to austerity, the only way to get it is to vote SNP. Question four, Kenneth Gibson. <laughs> Mr Gibson. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the impact on rural businesses and communities will be of Royal Mail's decision to reduce collection times at 3,300 Scottish post boxes. First Minister. Well, I'm concerned about any decisions which would have an adverse impact on Scotland's rural businesses and communities. The UK Government mishandled the unwanted sale of Royal Mail. It must now ensure that a privatised Royal Mail provides a service that suits Scotland's needs, in particular the vital service to our remote and rural communities. Mr Gibson. I thank the First Minister for her answer. Does she agree that the inevitable job losses among postal workers and the effect these reduced services will bring is a negation of the spirit, if not the letter, of the universal service obligation? And does this not show the detrimental impact that the privatisation of Royal Mail is having? First Minister. Well, this Government opposed the privatisation of the Royal Mail. The sell-off is inevitably leading con to concerns over the Royal Mail's ability to deliver the universal service obligation. Any job losses are to be deeply regretted and, of course, will make it more challenging for Royal Mail to meet its obligations. Uh, the report from the House of Commons Business Innovation and Skills Committee about competition in the postal sector and the universal service obligation recognises that market conditions are changing rapidly. Ofcom, the postal regulator, must ensure that it closely monitors the situation in Scotland and responds quickly if needed. The vital lifeline for many of Scotland's communities absolutely must be protected. Hugh Henry. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, Kenneth Gibson is absolutely right. This has been caused by the privatisation. But this specific problem has also been driven by Ofcom. Will the First Minister ask Ofcom to insist that later collection, collections should be protected? And will she support the CWU, the trade union, in asking Royal Mail to provide better information to customers about collection times? First Minister. I am certainly very happy to communicate that view and to support uh, the general concerns that Hugh Henry has expressed there too uh, of common. I hope we can get a degree of consensus in this chamber that some of the changes we are seeing do pose a risk to some of our communities and that it is absolutely essential we do everything we can to protect the lifeline service that so many of our communities rely on. Question number five, Ian Gray. To ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government is giving the poorest university students. First Minister. Well, one of this government's proudest achievements is the restoration of free higher education. In addition to free tuition, our minimum income guarantee provides students from the poorest households with 7,500 of living cost support every year. This support has helped to ensure that record levels of 18-year-olds from the most disadvantaged areas are being accepted to university. Uh, but we recognise and I believe strongly that we must do much more. That's why I announced in the programme for government that we will form a commission on widening access to advise on the clear milestones we must meet to ensure every child has the same chance of going to university and what practical measures we need to take to ensure that we achieve that ambition. Ian Gray. The fact of the matter is that uh, this government in recent years has systematically cut maintenance grants for these students. In fact, such students in Scotland now receive a maximum of £1,750. Students in England in their position would receive twice that. Uh, in Northern Ireland, they would receive twice that. And in Wales, they would receive three times that level of grant support. Indeed, apart from Iceland, Can we get a where there question, are no maintenance Mr. Gray? grants. Indeed, apart from Iceland, every single country in Western Europe provides more support for poorer students than Scotland does. The First Minister has talked a lot about hypothetical question. cuts today. This is a real cut. Will she reverse it as Labour First Minister. Well, of course. The students in England that Ian Gray refers to uh, pay tuition fees. Students in Scotland don't pay tuition fees. But for students, for students living at home, our minimum income guarantee of £7,500 a year for students from the poorest background is the highest in the UK. But I agree we need to do more. Now, I, I would hope Ian Gray and I could accept that we perhaps agree on this. I think we've got to do more to support students from the most disadvantaged parts of our country access university if that is what they want to do. That's why I have already announced the intention to set up the Widening Access Commission. But I do think people should be cautious about believing a word Labour says when it comes to student support. After all, it was 
Uh, Labour in 1997 in the election who said they wouldn't introduce tuition fees, who after the election did introduce tuition fees. It was Labour who in the 2001 election said they wouldn't introduce top-up tuition fees, who then after the election did introduce top-up tuition fees. So I stand by this government's record on student support. We will continue to take action to improve it, but I don't think people will believe a word Labour says when it comes to students. Thank you, President Officer. NUS Scotland uh, described the Scottish Government's package of student support as the best support package in the whole of the United Kingdom. Does the First Minister agree with me that it's a bit rich for parties which were pro-tuition fees to now try and rebrand themselves as parties for the students? First Minister. Well, as I've just said, I don't think people can believe a word Labour says. Labour has consistently broken their promises when it comes to tuition fees. Order. Again, I know they don't like hearing this, Order. but they fought the 1997 election on a no-fees promise. They broke that promise. They fought the 2001 election on a no-top-up fees promise. They broke that promise. I heard uh, somebody shout earlier on, what about in Scotland? When they came to office in the Scottish Parliament, they moved tuition fees from the front door to the back door, but they still impose tuition fees. You can't trust Labour on student support. You can trust the SNP because we abolished tuition fees. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the high dropout rate of students at Scottish universities and particularly at the University of the West of Scotland. What help could the Scottish Government give to both students and universities to help address this difficult, sensitive and indeed complex problem? First Minister. Well, it is a, a difficult and complex problem, but it is also an important issue for us to challenge. One of the issues I want the Widening Access Commission to look at is not just how we uh, support and encourage more uh, students from the poorest backgrounds to access university, but how we support them uh, to carry on through their university courses and complete the, those courses and to graduate. So uh, I'll be very keen, as the Widening Access Commission is set up and develops, uh, to share our thinking on that with members across the chamber. I am absolutely determined that we do everything we can uh, to make sure that every young person in Scotland has an equal chance of going to university and completing their university education. And I hope it is something that all of us across the chamber, regardless of our party background, can come together and support. Liam MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. In the recent uh, budget negotiations, Scottish Liberal Democrats urged the Deputy First Minister to increase the earnings threshold for repaying student loans from just under 17,000 to 21,000, as in the rest of the UK. This would save young graduates £368 a year. It is also something the government could do immediately with no impact on their budget. The First Minister says she wants to do more, so will she explain why her deputy rejected this move? Yeah. First Minister. Well, we are and will continue to consider these issues. Uh, I, I do believe that uh, although the differential threshold that Liam MacArthur refers to uh, is in place, uh, students, when they pay back their loans, pay them back at a lower rate of interest in order to compensate for that. But nevertheless, Liam MacArthur has raised this before. I think he raises a legitimate issue and it's one that the government will continue to consider. Question six, Lord Campbell. Presiding officer, to ask the First Minister what assistance the Scottish Government provides to cancer patients for day to day tasks. First Minister. Uh, the Government recognises that there are physical, financial, and often emotional consequences associated with a cancer diagnosis, which is why our Cancer Action Plan, Better Cancer Care, gives focus to supporting people living both with and beyond cancer. We work with a number of support organisations such as Macmillan to ensure that cancer patients are getting advice on the benefits and support that they are entitled to. Lord Campbell. I thank the First Minister for that answer. She may be aware of the Macmillan Cancer Research recent research paper hidden at home which revealed that half of cancer patients throughout the UK who have support or personal care needs only receive care from friends and family. What more can the Scottish Government do to provide support to these patients and indeed their carers? First Minister. I think anybody who has read the recent Hidden at Home Macmillan report will recognise that supporting cancer patients out with and beyond their clinical treatment is absolutely essential in ensuring that they get the best possible care and the best possible outcomes. That's why we are working with Macmillan Cancer Support to take forward the Transforming Care After Treatment programme. This programme is an excellent example of the third sector and Scottish Government working together to improve how care is delivered for people following a diagnosis of cancer. Rhoda Grant. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the First Minister will be aware that the report highlights that council cuts are impacting on people with cancer and indeed with other long-term conditions. Will she make it a priority to look at the services that are delivered to those people to make sure they are in place to support them? First Minister. Well, we've got to look to make sure that all agencies, whether it's uh, the NHS, local authorities or indeed third sector organisations who have got such a big part to play here, are equipped as well as they need to be uh, in order to support people who have a, a diagnosis of cancer. That's one of the many reasons we're working to integrate health and social care services so that there is a genuinely joined up approach to care. I think in Scotland we should be very proud of the cancer treatment and care that we provide for patients. But I, when I was health secretary, saw very, very regularly for myself uh, how difficult it is for patients diagnosed with cancer, not just to get through their treatment and the clinical part of their care, but to cope with all of the other consequences, whether they be financial or work-related or emotional. And we've got a duty to make sure we're providing adequate support across all of these issues. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We are now point to forward to James Kelly. Order. Let me hear Mr Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I know that during exchanges between the First Minister and Kezia Dugdale in relation to last week's debate in the House of Commons, uh, the First Minister stated that the SNP voted against that motion when in actual fact they abstained. Can I therefore... Can I therefore... Mr Kelly, that, Mr Kelly... In order that the, the, record, uh, the records are accurate, can I ask that the First Minister acknowledge her inaccuracy and have the record corrected during this session? Mr Kelly, you have made your point.